The demigods are each and all the What? This is better than my class I and Oh, oh Ali just put in the video. Yeah, it's by uh Vadi Vidya, if anyone was curious. He he makes really good lore videos for a bunch of different games. Direct offspring of Queen Marika. There is Godwin. The demigods are each and oh. all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. There was yes. Godwin, He's Morgoth, fucking dead. Moog, Radan, Rikard, Rani, Dude, she had Mikula, a lot of fucking kids. Melania, or Blade of he, Mikula. they? I don't know. Melania, Blade of Mikula. Melania, Blade of Mikula. And Melania, <laughs> not again. All of these demigods <laughs> had fallen from grace by the time the shattering occurred. But in this video, I want to mostly talk about the origins of these characters. Who these demigods were before the fall. And some of these demigods she was fell hot, a long way. Of course indeed. she had mad kids, bro. Before he became this <laughs> unsightly mess, fall. Godwin the Golden <laughs> was quite the heroic figure. He was born of the promising union between Lord Godfrey and Queen Marika, and he achieved great renown for his bravery in one of their wars at least, the War of the Ancient Dragons. This war began when Grandsax, a great ancient dragon, rained calamity down upon Lanedell, marking the only time in historical record that Lanedell's walls had fallen. It's not clear why Grandsax first attacked, but fortifying themselves against lightning, the Knights of the Erd Tree weathered his assault and Grandsax was defeated. However, this was only the beginning, and a bitter war against the ancient dragons was to follow. During this war, the Earth Tree Sentinels had an epiphany that the only way to truly protect the Earth Tree was to become dragons themselves. And so, despoiling the corpses of their foes, the grotesque Sentinels served the Earth Tree that but fought with the claws of the enemy instead. In the end, the ancient dragons were routed once again. In a graveyard of swords by the Stormcaller Church, the end of the war is commemorated. Here, we learn that during battle, Godwin the Golden defeated Fortisax, called the mightiest dragon of them all. However, he did not kill Fortisax. Instead, he befriended him. And it was in this act that the powers of the ancient dragons truly became a part of Laindel. After all, only those loved by dragons can survive the ordeal of cladding their bodies in lightning. So, from an unlikely friendship, an ancient dragon cult was born in the capital them, city, and the Knights of Laindell learned to worship the dragons and wield their lightning. Lanciax, sister of Fortisax, even took human form to better commune with the knights. It was officially decided that the worship of the ancient dragons did not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree, and it was all thanks to Godwin, commander of the dragon's golden lightning, and a true child of the golden lineage. But now, let's Only talk about Morgoth them? and Moog, Ow. the Omen twins, who were also born of Godfrey and Marika's golden How the lineage. fuck did I- I didn't realize that they were twins, I thought it was the same guy, like, coming back to, like, for round two or something. First, what is an Omen? Well, to put it simply, an Omen is an accursed child, seen as impure, it's hard to as follow, they are born bro. with horns on the body and face. When this happens, the correct thing to do culturally. Okay, why? Least. Okay, but why are they so cursed? If like their mom's like the queen, the god-appointed queen, their dad is a uh, Godfrey. Like this, like why are they cursed? What did they do to bad RNG? Actually, like an autistic kid. Oh my god, dude, you can't say that. It's not the same at all. <sighs> So it- I guess that they probably explain it. I just keep assuming that I'm supposed to know because you would think that they'd give the context bef before- ...is to cut it's off hard to the follow. horns of the omen, an act which usually causes them to perish. It's pretty messed up. But some omen do survive this process, and some omen are even given a cleaver omen. crafted specifically for them and awarded as a tool of war. Although oh, these, these weapons are bestowed with a readiness sewers. to take them away. We find one such omen in an Erd Tree camp upon the Altus Plateau. Before you fight it, you might have noticed another omen nearby writhing in its sleep. It's said that omens see evil spirits in their nightmares, and I think this omen is dreaming, haunted by the vengeful spirits of its so accursed kin. That 
This brings us to the show. omen killers, who are horrifying butchers of twisted conscience. They wear these horned masks that make a mockery of the omen's nightmares, and these butchers hunt the omen and amputate their horns. The first omen killer was named Rollo, a famous perfumer who had to imbibe a physic to rid himself of emotion so that he could better perform his tasks. Remember, it seems many omen have their horns excised when they're very young. That's definitely disturbing enough to warrant an emotion killing physic in my book. However, Dude, if I didn't the omen use the physic flasks royalty, like at all. Then their horns are not cut off, but the omen is kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone. Yes, no, no, no. I mean like the the ones that you can like mix different effects. You would have seen all kinds of omen confined to the sewers beneath Lane Dell. I did. But why are omen considered to be accursed in the first place? Some of them are clearly intelligent, so what's inherently wrong with being born with horns and great strength? Well, it's important to remember, I think, that this curse might only really exist in the context of the Golden Order. After all, those afflicted with omen horns are not able to return to the Erd Tree for rebirth and are said to be born outside of its grace. But why does the Golden Order disavow the omen, then? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but my working theory is that it's to do with the Crucible. According to this ancient incantation, horns were once an aspect of the Erd Tree's primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together. And with the exception of a couple of Crucible Knights in and around Landell, we know that the Golden Order has started to distance itself from most things that touch upon the Crucible. While things like horns, knots, feathers, and scales once grew on the human body and were considered signifiers of the divine, now they are disdained as impurities as civilization has advanced. We learn this from the knot, scale, and feather talismans, all of which are guarded by omen, or dropped by omen killers, no less. Unfortunately for the Order of the Erd Tree, these once divine impurities seem to crop up in some births, whether they like it or not. Almost like it's a genetic trait, as if it touches upon the crucible at the root of the Erd Tree. And so you have to ask, is it really a curse to be born as a graceless omen? Well, as with most curses in these games, I think that, that I killed my one on friend in the game! In any case, Moog and Morgoth were omen royalty and thus they were born into a wretched mire far below the earth, horns and all. Here, they were kept under the strictest confinement. Each of them were bound with charmed shackles that were covered in roots or thorns and bathed in golden magic. It seems very few people were supposed to know that they even existed. Morgoth, for his part, renounced and despised his accursed omen blood, but his brother Moog embraced it. Deep underground, Moog stood before an outer god, a being called the Formless Mother who craves wounds, a being capable of bestowing power upon accursed blood. In this moment, Moog's accursed blood erupted with fire. Wait, so that is and he the became same guy. What? With the defilement that he was born into. The here, one underground and the one the earth, here. He would go on to build a dynasty of blood in reverence of a no. mother. Something it seems Wait, so he never tried. Oh, yeah, they're had. twins. As for Morgoth, he was born into the same accursed fate brother? as his twin brother, they... but despite not being blessed Wait, with also grace, twins? he loved the Erd Tree all the same, and even took it upon himself to crawl Wait, so, out of the sewers. So America and, and Godfrey had two sets of fucked up twins, and they just kept making more? No, there's only two? He forgot their shadows first. The one in the sewer was fake. Oh, okay, so it was the same guy. That's what I was asking. I mean, not literally the same guy, but it, it's like the same guy, just a fake one. And become the Erd Tree's protector when okay, the Erd Tree needed asking. him most. In the end, he rightfully became the Omen King and Lord of Landell. Omen or not, he was, after all, born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. What do you think of that course, the marriage between Godfrey, Godfrey and Marika like, would be ended. And kids. before long, Marika remarried with another man, a champion named Radigan, who Marika calls her other half. He became second Elden Lord and the King Consort, but he Yo. also brought with him three children from a previous marriage <laughs> that he had had like with that? a Carrion Queen named Renala. These children were Rani, Rikard, and Radan, and they all became demigod stepchildren after Radigan's union, reunion with Queen Marika. 
possessed of his father's flaming red hair, Radan was fond of its heroic implications and considered himself to be born of a great champion. Yet he also looked up to another man, Godfrey I never the First saw his Lord, face Queen Merica's first husband like, and the Lord <laughs> of the battlefield. But Radan wasn't just the son of Radigan and an aspiring lord of the battlefield, he was also the son of Ranala, who was head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria and Queen of Caria. So as a Carian royal, inclined towards sorcery, Radan bent his will towards mastering gravitational magics. Rock sling, gravity well, collapsing stars, these techniques were taught to him in Celia, the town of sorcery, all Fox so he would never have to abandon his beloved so but scrawny steed. That said, before long, his powers would What's be put towards a more family? cosmic purpose yeah. than simply allowing him to ride his own horse. Radan was taught gravitational magic by an alabaster lord, a member of a race of ancients with skin of stone who was said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. And when his lessons were complete, Radan uttered these chilling words. Thank you for your tutelage, for now I can challenge the stars. And of course, he did conquer the stars and the very constellations would be halted by his strength. But of course, you kind of have to ask, why? Why was it necessary to conquer the stars in the first place? Well, I have a couple of theories. Theory one is that it was done in self-defense. After all, according to the sword gravestone, Radan was protecting Celia. What's more, gravitational magic has destructive power, and many gravitational beasts but this thing too! This power. stupid a being named cow. Astel Holy had even shit. come down to the lands between the, the past Super Saiyan Dr. and destroyed a place Thanks called the Eternal City. What's more, Celians are descendants of the Eternal, positioned right above the Eternal City underground, so there is an argument to be made for Radan purely defending Celia for some reason here. But it's possible for Radan to have fought in this conflict and to have made the first move as well. So this is theory two, that Radan conquered the stars as a preventative measure in service to the greater will. According to a set of astrologer items, the night sky cradles fate. There's even a banished sect of people called the Nox, who live like, deep what below does the that earth even, dude, in eternal- Dude, I hate when lore's like, the night sky cradles fate. It's like, okay, but what does that mean? Oh my god, some fantasy lore is just so hard to follow. Of the coming age of stars and their lord of night. <laughs> yeah, if you Long know, ago, you know, I these guess. these people invoked the ire of the greater will. So it would make sense that those in service to the greater will might have sought to arrest the stars and put an end to this fate. Mm -hmm. What's more, Radan was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey, and he seems to have more loyalty Radan? to the Erd Tree than- Wait, but Radan is Renala. Wait. Wait. Wait, who is he? Oh, I'm sorry was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey. So he's a fan of his stepmom's cucked ex-husband. Dude, this is some crazy family drama. I'm sorry, I had to go back to listen again to check. This is crazy. Oh my god. And he seems to have more loyalty to the Erd Tree than to the moon. Finally, the telescope what? item description oh, says that the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. So surely this is referencing Radan's actions, and it levels the blame at the Golden Order. But putting Radan's <laughs> motivations aside, it's a fact that the British. stars were held back, and that this had great consequences for many, especially for the rest of his Carrion royal family. Let me explain. The fate of the Carian royal family is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Lady Rani, first heir in the Carian royal line. But General Radan is the conqueror of the stars, who stood up to the swirling constellations, halting their movement in a smashing victory. And so, if General Radan were defeated, the stars would once again resume their movement. As would Lady Rani's destiny. Wait. Luna Princess Rani was the daughter. Wait, wait till she finds out Moog was dating his child half brother. Wait, Mikola? Wait, is that Mikola? 
Wait, they weren't dating, were they? More like kidnapped. What? <laughs> what the fuck? Sister of Radigan and Renala, and sister to Radan. Interestingly, if you look at her true body atop the Divine Tower, it looks like she might have also inherited the red hair of Radigan. Cool detail. But unlike her brother, Radan, she quite clearly took after her mother, Mor, who was Renala, head of the Carrion royal family. They killed her. The House of Caria Kinda. has this really storied history, alive, one that seems crazy. to go way back to the, the astrologers. Goofy, In the Carrion Manor, we find one of their treasures, the Sword of Night and Flame. It reads, Astrologers, who preceded the sorcerers, established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky and considered the fire giants their neighbors. Renala herself was an astrologer, always chasing the stars in her youth. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer but what became does that, the queen. But what does that, what does it mean that she met the moon? Like she saw it in the sky and was like, damn, or like they act, I don't, we're like, what does that mean? But what does that mean? She she met the moon and ate that. <laughs> the moon is an outer god. But what does it mean that they met? Like, they talked? Or like... They had dinner, okay. Oh my god, this is driving me crazy. Egg. Use your brain. I guess I'm just too dumb to understand meat in the moon. That's why I'm asking. It's like a blessing. She, she fricked the moon. I don't understand, oh, yeah. bro. Karia appears to have a matriarchal hierarchy with multiple princesses and Karia knights that serve as their retainers. Now, however, there is only one princess. Dude, I feel I, like Vadi making these videos, like he's gotta just be like, she met the moon, okay? I can't explain it, but it happened, so I'm gonna put it in the video to explain how this ha how this part got to this part. <laughs> Rani, daughter of Renala. And at the time of her birth, she would have been set to inherit quite a lot of power indeed, for the Carrion royal family was at its height, and her mother was not only queen, she was also head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria, having bewitched them so with the enchanting power of the full moon. Leading the young Rani by the hand, Renala guided her daughter to a meeting with a moon of her own. What a Rani moon of her own? Was cold. What does that mean? A moon of her own? So they're like, the moons aren't separate entities? There's two moons. Okay, so... Oh my god, she has her own moon. Um... I'm just like <laughs> staring at chat trying to find answers and I'm not getting them. <laughs> okay, she met her own moon. I, I understand dark what happened. And veiled in occult mystery. A dark moon. A sort of twin to Renala's own full moon. You can even see both of these hanging in the sky if you stargaze okay. from the heights of the moonlight plateau. So there's two moons. Another who guided Rani was a character moon, moon. called the Snowy Crone, who the young Rani encountered deep in the woods. When you look at Rani, it's actually the likeness of this snow witch that you're seeing, as the doll that now houses Rani's soul was modeled after her, probably as a sign of respect. Clearly, Rani looked up to this mysterious woman. She became Rani's secret mentor, and so she even knew she about the dark moon, she actually teaching look the like? young Rani to fear it as she imparted her cold sorceries. So, what do these moons represent? That's just a theory, but I think the moons kind of act as guides. Uh, the lost black moon of Noxtella, for example, her? was the guide of countless stars. No, What's more, I know, but Rani she and was Renala like were heavily influenced crispy. by their moons. Renala's moon bewitched the academy that she became the head of, and Rani's dark moon, for its part, also imparts wisdom and leads a voyage in the Age of Stars ending. They could even be outer gods. That's and yet, I got, for all of right? this guidance, Caria and Leonia as a whole have experienced steep decline. Radigan betrayed the House of the Moon. Radan locked the stars out of motion. 
The academy town is flooded to the north. Caria has been ruined in the west, and the stars and moon have gone their separate ways. Nevertheless, Rani, last princess of Caria, remains, carefully setting new plans into motion. Sibling to Rani and Radan was a man named Rikard, who was lord of the Volcano Manor. There is evidence that Rikard was friendly with his siblings, he conspired with his sister Rani later on, and there's even a portrait of Radan hung oh, in the shit. Volcano Manor, as noticed. well as a portrait of Rikard himself before the fall. Item descriptions mark Rikard as stern, ambitious, heroic, and blasphemous. A part of this blasphemy was opposing the Erd Tree, which actually drew many knights to his banner, for Rikard believed in taking by force, just as the gods did, and clearly many believed that he would usher in a new age. The armor set of the Gelmir Knights reveals to us what were once very loyal soldiers. The crest of red feathers are there to symbolize Rikard's pedigree as Lord Radigan's son, and the emblem upon their chest piece represents a lord who had lofty ambitions. However, okay. as Rikard delved into the ancient secrets of Mount Gelmir, he came across the immortal Great Serpent, an Box ancient destiny three that puppy aligned block. with Rikard's ambitions. There and so, Rikard fed himself for to the, the Great Serpent months. so that he might devour, <laughs> grow, and live <laughs> eternally. Alas, this was too much for his knights, and they believed that their master's heroic ambitions had degenerated into mere greed. So they searched desperately for a weapon with which they might halt their lord. And they found it too. The immortal serpent had lived for a long time, and so there was also a weapon to kill it that had been designed long ago as well. A serpent hunter. But it was too late. As the Lord lost his dignity, oh, so too did the knights lose their master. Not that it bothered Rikard. No, we can God together. So why did Rikard become a snake? Next, we need to discuss Whatever, Melania dude. and Mikola. These two were twins as they were born. You missed it to no, Rikard, because please. he felt anyway. like it. Sorry, it's just really hard to. Find. He fed himself to. Okay. What a dumbass, bro. Dude, the people in this game make really questionable choices. Like, why don't you just, like, be born, you know, get a fucking job or something? Why do you have to, like, destroy death and get eaten by a snake and date the moon and, and like, I don't know, make a, a shadow clone of yourself and your twin? As you know, Radigan's marriage okay. with Renala yeah. did not last. Afterwards, he returned to the Golden Order and became Queen Marika's consort. But what I haven't yet mentioned is that, together, they were blessed with two demigod children, the so-called twin prodigies. Wait, so there's- now Marika also has grandchildren! Dude, why- if you have kids, why would you feed yourself to the snake? Like, dude- they're all just awful fucking parents. Like, I I would hate to have those parents. No, not gra- wait, what? Wait, then who- hold on. To the Golden Order. Most and replayed. Queen Marika's <laughs> so consort. the most confusing but what part? I haven't yet mentioned is that together they were blessed with two oh. demigod children. I thought he was still talking about Rikard. God damn it. Okay, never mind. The so-called twin prodigies. Now, in the last lore video, I briefly proposed that these two twins were born after the Shattering, after Radigan and Marika had merged together to become a single god. However, I've since changed then my mind. I think compare? Millennia and Mikula were clearly born before the Shattering. There's just so much proof that these two twins were a force that were influencing the world long before the Shattering took place. Uh, anyway, both of these twins were born afflicted. Specifically, in the Japanese text, it's said that their births were vulnerable. Mikola was born afflicted with eternal youth, and Millennia, for her part, was vulnerable to rot. Interestingly, Millennia's Scarlet Rot is actually an outer god. This outer god, like many others in the game, what? seems to have an order that is able to be imposed upon the world via an Empyrean vessel, and Millennia was that vessel. Okay, and while the so Scarlet there's... Rot is pretty she was terrible. born cursed with rot, and there's also a rot god that lives inside her. 
uh, you can sort of argue that it's got a beauty to it. Um, according to Gowry, the order of rot it's is resplendent. Right, right. Okay. It's a cycle of death and rebirth. Kind of like the lotus flower, which is a flower that blooms anew, beautiful and fresh from mud. I actually have art of this flower hanging in my home. I always love the symbol of it. I actually have lots of art hanging now, and I'm going cool to talk art. about all of this artwork that you can buy oh my God. in the video. <laughs> anyway, so millennia, the Empyrean was vulnerable to and afflicted by the Scarlet Rot. There was said to be no cure to this, and while fire and consecration seemed to be somewhat effective at warding it off, millennia would slowly lose her physical self to the Rot. Interestingly, old legends of the Scarlet Rot have persisted in the world for generations, and we learn more about the Rot God from the Blue Dancer charm. The Dancer in Blue represents a fairy who, in legend, bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. Specifically, this god was long ago sealed away in the stagnant water that is downstream of the Ainsel River underground. Okay. And wherever rot appears, the kindred of rot appear as well. These are pests and servants of they the sure rot. They sure fucking are pests. Now, in the current uh... age, these are servants that have been forsaken by Millennia, who is their new goddess. So, this blind swordsman with the flowing curved sword actually went on to become Millennia's mentor. So technically it's him that we have to blame for this goddamn attack. The prosthesis wearer heirloom tells us more. A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. Millennia's ridiculous attack is called the waterfowl dance, and Fuck aesthetically it makes sense that, you know, flowing waters would counter the effects of rot, for just as still waters turn foul, stagnation turns to decay. Thus, warriors must remain ever drifting. And indeed, Millennia does resist the call of the rot. There's a lot of evidence that she's not really a willing vessel, but through sheer will and sense of self, she resists the rot. And only when she is truly pressed in battle will she, sure she abandon she this will and bloom into the goddess within. Millennia's first bloom was during her fight against Radan, and releasing her Scarlet Rot was a last-ditch effort that would forever taint the land of Kaled and cripple Radan. So, whatever like she was fighting for was in this fault? fight against Radan, somehow Ow. it was worth this terrible act. In general terms, at least, it's clear that Millennia was fighting for her brother. Apart from the times where she relapses into being the goddess of Rot, she is known as the Blade of Mikla. She actually goes to great lengths to tell you this. I don't know if you heard. Uh, despite being the <laughs> toughest boss in From Software history, she's actually fighting for his right to godhood, not her own. In Millennia's own Aww. words, her brother Mikola possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. For his part, Mikola did a lot to earn his sister's dedication, not the least of which was inspiring her armor and a prosthetic of unalloyed gold. Wait, so what did he do that was It's so not special? just his sister that loved Mikola, many people did. The Bewitching Branch is an item that you can use Yay, to turn Ring. enemies into temporary allies, and it reads, Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. For his father Radigan, Mikola fashioned and gifted to him a fundamentalist incantation called Triple Rings of Light. Radigan then returns the favor, gifting back an incantation so called Radigan's of Rings of Light. These interactions show some of Mikola's positive connections with his father and also Golden Order fundamentalism. He's an oiler? And yet, the young Mikola <laughs> abandoned oh. <laughs> fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Millennia's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. So, what is unalloyed gold? Well, an alloy is a composition of metals, so unalloyed gold is pure gold essentially, with no external mixtures. This gold apparently can ward away the meddling of outer gods, and so Mikola bent a lot of his efforts towards creating an unalloyed gold needle. Specifically, this needle was crafted for his sister, 
to ward off the rot god and forestall the effects of the incurable rotting sickness. We see the bond between the siblings as well when we visit Mikola's Halig tree. We see a statue of a one-armed woman embracing a child, Mikola. In this place, we see the biggest example of Mikola's benevolence, the Halig tree, and the society that was built into the brace that supports it. This was a promised land, seen as a salvation to many who were shunned or persecuted, provided that they can actually find the path here, of course. And like many other Empyreans, Mikola seems to have had the will within them to create a new order, and his is an order that's somewhat modelled on the ones that came before it. The biggest thing is that the Halig tree is clearly inspired by the Erd tree. But the difference is that Mikola's Halig tree is said to be accepting of all, even those the Erd tree shuns. Mikola himself was once embedded inside of the Halig tree, and he watered it with his very own blood since it was a mere sapling. Tragically, however, he was ripped out of this womb during the shattering, and his Halig tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd tree, becoming a misshapen husk instead. But that's the story for another day. There's also a ton of cut content to do with Mikola, and he's one of the most mysterious demigods, who I'm sure we'll learn about more later. But there is one more thing that I want to mention before I go. It's kind of one theory I had during the making of this video. So, Mikola and Millennia each have their own butterflies. Millennia's is the Aeonian butterfly, which inhabit the swamp of Aeonia, and are rumored to come from the wings of the rot goddess herself. And I think it's fair to say that Mikola's butterfly is the nascent butterfly, which appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. This is a reference to Mikola's eternal youth and oh, his both. cocoon in the Halig tree. But there is, of course, a third butterfly, right? There's the smoldering butterfly. It's said to be an eternally burning butterfly that serves as kindling. Now bear with me, but it's my theory that this butterfly is a reference to Melina, who the Blade of Calling calls the kindling maiden and the one who walks alongside flame. This might suggest that Melina is a sibling to Melania and Mikola. What? Again, that's just a theory, but what I really uh, want to talk about here is that, at the very no least, way. Melina is almost certainly the daughter of Marika. We learned this a long time what? ago from looking at her name in the game's files, and we can further infer it from her dialogue, as she has a few lines that refer to mothers and one that says that she was born inside the Erd tree. So, her being the daughter of Marika is also just a theory, but this one is much more concrete than the butterfly one. Although the reason I like the butterfly theory is that it gives us a I hint mean, as to who Melina's parents might have been. Her parents would have been Radigan and Marika, which is to say Marika herself alone, I guess, because Radigan is Marika. Honestly, Melina as a character <laughs> has only become more so mysterious since the game was released, and I'm really only scratching the surface with this theory. But speaking of times before Elden Ring was released, back then, a long time ago, I commissioned this piece from a renowned artist named Marco, and now I'm so excited to reveal it for the first time. This storybook scene is heavily inspired by the early looks we had at Elden Ring, with a red-haired protagonist, spirit companions, a mount that looks like Yakul and a bit like Torrent, and a few other hidden details in the piece. This piece and all of my other prints are now available over at Spring, where you can actually buy them fully framed and ready to hang. They actually ship the with a beautiful frame. Suicide the frame squad. itself this is a nice This man his black. ads, bro, he fucking deserves it though. These videos are crazy. I'm not subbed to him. I thought that I was from when I watched his Dark Souls videos. Maybe I unsubbed on accident. <laughs> Skips. I, well, well, if you, I mean, but he, it has 5 million views. He's fine. He's fine.